John chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto, unto him, They have no wine. And by the way, that wine, you could have drank on it for until eternity begins, and you'd have never felt any effects from it. It was nothing more than, un, than the, the vine, the fruit of the vine. And uh, he said, Jesus, verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were, and there were set, set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine unto now. The beginning of these miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Look again, if you will, tonight in verse number 3. Notice with me, the Bible says, and there's a phrase there, and when they wanted. And I want to use that for our subject tonight, the Lord be my helper. And I want to preach for just a little while this evening on this thought. What you're willing to do without, you'll never have. What we are willing to do without, we will never have. Now, that word wanted in this verse is a very important word. You see, it tells you and I tonight that those who had gathered at the wedding feast there at Cana of Galilee had a longing for a desire for something. Boy, may God put that in our hearts in these days, that we have a longing for the things of God in our life. Matter of fact, I believe the impact and the outcome and the success of this entire story hinges on that one word, wanted. If you don't have it underlined or highlighted in your Bible, if you do that, I'd encourage you to do so. May I say, listen, unless we want something, you and I will never get anything. Right. And what we're willing again to do without, we'll never have. Now, let's please listen carefully what I'm about to say. I want you to grasp this. As far as mining your spirituality is concerned, mining your spirituality will never rise above our want or our willingness. Mining your spirituality as a believer will never rise above what our want may be and our willingness to receive and to achieve it. Right, right. Now, I just want to go a little deeper right here if I can. Uh, we know that we're free moral agents. We were all born uh, as free moral agents. Right. And mining your spiritual condition is not controlled by God's will. Right. But mining your spiritual condition, Brother Greg, it is something that is controlled by our will. You cannot tonight take our spiritual condition and our will and separate it. Brother Jim, it's, un it's inseparable. Our will and our spirituality, our condition. In other words, whatever our spiritual level may be tonight, it is what it is because that's the way we want it to be. I thought about old blind Bartimaeus as a case at point. And you know the story, old blind Bartimaeus sat by the highway side begging. There came the Lord Jesus and he asked blind Bartimaeus, he said, What wilt thou have me do unto thee? Well, at that moment, God opened up all of heaven for him. He could have got everything and anything he wanted. But blind Bartimaeus said that I might receive my sight. 
Again, let me say tonight, beyond any doubt, whatever our spiritual level may be, it is what it is because that's the way we want it to be. Now, can I go a little bit deeper? Mine and your spiritual condition is gauged by what we're willing to allow and what we are willing to tolerate and accept in our life. Our spiritual condition tonight, it is gauged by what we're willing to accept, what we're willing to allow, and what we're willing to tolerate in our life. You see, they were at the wedding feast of Canaan and Galilee. They didn't have any more wine, Brother Mike. But the one thing about them there, they weren't willing to do without it. They had to have it. They had to have it. They weren't going to do without it. The question again, I want us to ask ourselves tonight is this. What are we willing to tolerate in our life? What are we willing to do without in mind in your lives? Are we willing to tolerate tonight and accept deadness and accept coldness and accept defeat and, to, and accept division and decline and drifting away from the things of God? I believe in all and in every sense of the word, I believe we have came to that point in many churches today. And they just seem to drift away from God. They accept walking into a cold and dry service. I'm not saying that's what we have here, and thank God we don't. I'm glad, praise God, you walk into Emmanuel Baptist Church and you can sense and you can feel the moving of God. And I'll be honest with you tonight, I do know why God's here. God's here because it's based on preaching. This church was birthed right, and it stayed right, and its stand is right, its pastor's right, and thank God for it this uh, tonight. I want to ask you something. Are we willing to accept and tolerate carnality, coldness, contentment in mind in your life? Again, what we're willing to do without, we'll never have. Listen, are we willing to do without revival? This is one of the first times I've really had a burden to preach on revival uh, tonight. Are we willing to do without revival? And for, I'll be honest with you, for the most part, people in, in many churches, revival is an option. It's optional. <laughs> we need a reason for revival, brother. And I tell you, we got a reason. I'll be honest with you, I could, I could go out and say, look at this world, look at the government, uh, look at what's going on around us tonight. But Brother Greg, in all honesty, it's not the world, it's not the government, it's not the White House, it's what's taking place in the church house tonight. Hey, if my people, I'm going to get there, I don't want to jump the gun, but if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Lord said, I'll hear their prayer, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The reason we're not having revival tonight is because many times we view revival as being unnecessary. Our heart and our eyes, more, more often than not, they're focused on the things of the world, on the pleasures of the world, on personal pursuits in life and on things on people and providing for what we want, what I want. Brother Greg said it so, so uh, graciously the other evening when he talked about what's in the middle word, the middle letter in the word of pride is I. I. <laughs> Another question we need to ask ourselves is this. Why are we willing to do without what God is able to give us? Why are we willing to do without what God is able, and let me go another step and want him to give you an eye. Bible says in the book of Ephesians, now unto him that is able to do, exceeding abundantly above all that you and I could ever ask or think. I'm just going to sum it up this way. The reason we're not having revival in our, in our churches tonight is simply because of this. We're satisfied without it. Might as well go ahead and let's smile. Get our halos off. Put them under the pew. Let's nod our heads. And go ahead and swallow that. And everybody say, Amen. We're not having revival tonight because we don't want to pay the price. We get comfortable. We get complacent. 
And we get in a zone, and, and any time we have to go out of that zone, it kind of it kind of makes us feel uneasy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my soul! It's a known fact that what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace it. They're going to accept it. See, we need revival tonight because not only because of complacency, but also because of contentment and because of coldness. But now get this. We need revival tonight, Brother Phil, if for none other reason than for this generation right here. These young people. This generation to come. They need to see a real move of God. Hey, and it's up to you and I. We got to be willing to pay the price to receive that which God wants you and I to have. Now, if you will, turn over to Psalm 85. In Psalm 85, you'll find when you read this chapter, I better get there too, praise God. When we read this chapter, you'll find that it's divided into two parts. You'll find in the first three verses, you'll find the psalmist is praising God for a geographical restoration. I mean, they had been brought out of Babylonian captivity. I mean, they was no longer in that strange land. So we see them tonight praising the Lord for a geographical restoration. But then in the last ten verses of Psalm 85, you'll find the psalmist is praying to God for spiritual revival. <laughs> you see, it's possible tonight to be in the right place and not be in the right spirit. See, they were no longer in a strange land. They were no longer held captive. And they were out of captivity. And they was in the right place now, but they didn't have the right spirit about them. That's possible. It's possible to be in the house of God and be as cold as a ham and cheese sandwich on rye bread. Somebody say amen right there. This is, it's, it's that possible. Sure it is. Now, with that said, I want you to notice something with me tonight when it comes to revival. We find, first of all, here in Psalm 85, we find the psalmist's desperation for revival. It's evident. He realized how urgent it was. In verse 6, he said, Wilt thou not revive us again, O Lord, that thy people may rejoice in me, rejoice in thee? Kind of reminds me of Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord and he would not let the angel of the Lord go until he was blessed. I'm going to tell you, God, give us that kind of desire. May God give us that kind of yearning and longing in mind and your heart to see God move one more time in our lives. We want to see our churches change. It starts with each and every one of us. From the pulpit to the pew. We hold a great responsibility in our hand tonight. And that great responsibility is to experience revival so that we may get out into this lost and dying world and be effective and reach sinners for Christ and reach those saints that have gone wayward for whatever the reason and get them back in the house of God. As sad as it may be, we've lost that desperation for revival in many churches. Why is the psalmist so desperate? In Psalm 86, Psalm 85, verse 6. I believe for a number of reasons. I believe because God's people, could it be because God's people were in a backslidden condition? I mean, could it be? I thought about in verse 1, look there with me. He said, the Lord, he said, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land, and thou hast brought back, brought back the captivity of Jacob. Brought them back. Undoubtedly, they had slid out and slid back somewhere. He brought them back. Oh, could it be tonight that they were backslid? Could it be tonight? Can I go a little deeper, Pastor? 
Could it be tonight maybe we're here in the house of God and on a Wednesday night in our comfort zone and in the depths of our heart we backslid on God in the depths of our heart we say with our lips we want revival but our actions speak otherwise could it be because God's people were backslidden could it be that the people of God were in a burdened down condition look at verse 6 again he says will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. Brother Ray could have been they were carrying a pretty heavy burdens. That could have been one reason why it was so desperate a need for revival. I'll be honest with you, with the burdens that God's people carry week after week and day after day, boy, how, how great it would be for revival to break out in our hearts and in our homes and in the house of God that we might be able to bear those burdens in life. We see here tonight, not only could it be they were in a backslidden condition, in a burden condition, but could it be they were in a bearing condition? Look in verse 9. Psalmist says, Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Undoubtedly they were barren. They were empty. There was no power. There was no passion. There was no presence of God. Again, he said, Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. I tell you what, wouldn't it be a blessing to see the old time fear of God sweep our nation tonight? Well, I'm going to tell you, it starts right here in the house of God. And it starts right here among us as God's people. We see here not only the desperate need or the desperation for revival, but notice the dispenser of revival. Who's responsible for revival? Well, let me back up and give you this. Revival requires prayer. We ain't going to have it. Old Brother Mike went down to my church and preached on Sunday night about prayer. My Lord, every time I call Miss Cindy, she's asking me, are you praying? I tell you, yeah, I am. I tell you, I pray more. I've been praying more than I've prayed in a while. And I tell you, it feels good. I'm the first to admit my prayer life has never been what it ought to be. But I'll be honest with you tonight, church. I'm ahead in that way. I'm trying to get it where it ought to be. I'm trying to get closer to God. Hey, I tell you, if I want to see God move at Almeda Baptist Church and, and we want to see God move here in Emmanuel Baptist Church, we got to get serious. We got to take responsibility for some things. Revival require, requires prayer. Revival also rests in a person. That's the dispenser of revival. Again, the psalmist said, Wilt thou? Wilt thou? I tell you what, I got a whole briefcase slam full of sermons and messages there in the motel room. But I'll be honest with you, I can't bring revival. A message can't bring revival. But I know a God that can. I know the Holy Ghost wants to move in our hearts and in our lives. If we have revival tonight, it'll be simply because the sovereign God made a sovereign choice to send it. Are you listening? A sovereign God has to make a sovereign choice to send it. And Brother Donald Trump, I believe he wants to send it. But we got to be willing. What's the word I'm looking for? Somebody say it for me. We got to be willing people. Lord have mercy. Yes, yeah, say it louder, Brother Brian. Yeah, my, my denture, I can't pronounce it. Say amen right there. God help. Notice how many times David refers to God in, in Psalm 85. In verse 1, he says, Lord, and he says, Thou. In verse 2, he says, Thou again twice. In verse 3, again, he says, Thou two more times. We know the word salvation in verse number 4 is not referring to redemption, but it's referring to deliverance. That's what we need tonight. Hey, we need deliverance. Hey, he's the dispenser of revival because he's the sovereign God and because he's minding your salvation. Now watch this. 
Not only do we see tonight the psalmist's desperation for revival, revival requires prayer. Not only the dispenser of revival because revival rests in a person. But also find tonight, and I call your attention to this, there's the direction of revival. Because you see, revival restores passion. That's what we see here in verse number 8. Notice what he says. He says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. You see, if we'll just be honest tonight, Brother Josh, we're prone to wonder. Yes, we are. We're prone to leave the God we love. Oh, we just got to get honest tonight. Oh, well, a lot of times we can talk the talk and, and speak the language and the verbiage, but many times deep down in our heart, we're not really meaning what we're saying. We're not really seeking like we should. We're not really turning our life over to Him as we ought to day in and day out and week after week and month after month whether you're on a mountain or whether you're in a valley whether things are good or whether things are bad whether things are going hard or whether things are being a blessing in life we got to learn to turn ourselves over to Him. In the book of Judges you'll find 13 times God restored his people. See, they were in a vicious cycle of coming to God and then going away from God. See, and that's the same way we are. Oh, listen, we are, during, a lot of times during revival meeting, uh, we'll make all kind of promises. We'll make all kind of vows to God. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, this better not vow, vow than break it. It's better not to come up and promise God anything. I tell you, I just wonder a lot of times if we don't come to the altar and pray and we make promises to God only to turn loose of those promises a few days, a few weeks, a, a few months down the road and we wonder why we're not really having revival. Revival starts with each individual saved by the good grace of God in this auditorium tonight. I believe you're hungry people. I believe you want it. I, really, I know your pastor does. and his. I know, you, I know they do, and I know you do. But I tell you, we got to sacrifice to get it. we got to come clean with God to have it. we got to get honest with God. I mean honest, brutally honest. I tried to explain a little bit the other night when I was preaching. But on that piece of paper when I wrote down those sins, and after two pages I had to quit. That's how brutally honest we ought to get. Hey, I forgot to tell you. You know what I did with those paper, those two pages? You know what I did with them? I wadded them up in my hand. I went in there in the commode. I lifted up the lid. I dropped it down in there. I let it get good and soaked. Guess what? A hey, little thing on the side. I pl plunger. That, that what they call handle. I push that handle down. That thing. Holy Ghost said, "Gone." I say the Holy Ghost said it to me. I knew it was gone. But Brother Josh, the Holy Ghost stood up and the gable in my soul and done a salute and said, gone. That's what we need to do. Let's get brutally honest. And it ain't easy. i just be honest with you. God showed me something in the, in the room this past week, these past few days. He showed me it's going to take a repetition, a daily, a getting brutally honest. I mean, a getting up at the end of that day, instead of Brother Mike so preached at our church, laying your head down and, and saying, now I lay me down to sleep. I, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And should I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about looking back over the day's events and say, Lord, please forgive me for that thought. Please forgive me for my old attitude. I know you work hard. You go on the job. A lot of times you've got, you've got lost overseers that, that is on the job and they make it hard on you. And I know, listen, a lot of times they'll try to make it difficult. But you know what you got to do? You got to show them the love of God. You got to be nice to them. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. 
And every day you may not be able to do it. Brother Jim, that's whenever we need to get brutally honest. Look back over that day and say, Lord, I messed up today. I said something I ought not to have said. Oh, I, I, I spewed out something, Lord, that had, should have never came out of my mouth. I thought something in my mind, God, that I never should have thought. I let my eyes wander, Lord, where they never should have wandered before. I mean brutally honest. I mean deep down honest. Aren't you glad, praise God, Brother Doug's collar didn't turn around backwards? Backwards. I, I catch myself I try to correct some of my southern slang up there so y'all y'all can understand. I know it takes about fifteen minutes for you to grasp what my my verbiology is. Yeah. That's a word. It sounds good. But aren't you glad his collar's not turned around backwards? You don't gotta go tell him. Right. Oh listen, I'm gonna tell you, you get it to God, and I promise you that this he'll see the difference. Yeah. He'll see a difference in your attitude. Yeah. He'll see your difference in the way you conduct yourself and, and coming in. Hey, I will tell you what, ain't nothing wrong with coming in the house of God with a smile on your face. You know it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Hey, take your frown and turn it upside down, praise God. Smile, come in happy. Why? Because the same God that saved you. Miss Janice, the same God to forgive you of your sin daily. The same God that washed you clean will allow you to come before His presence. And if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a loving God. That's a caring God. That's why David said, Will thou not revive us again, O Lord, that thy people may rejoice in thee. We see here tonight revival. Again requires prayer. Revival rests in a person. Revival restores passion. But I want you to notice something else tonight. Revival renews its people. It's, the details of revival, what does it involve? Number one, look in verse one. A returning. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back. Brought back the captivity of Jacob returning resolve in your heart you, and I'm going to be honest with you you can't do it overnight no I wish I could tell you with, I, like preacher Doug sometimes I wish I had a magic wand so that I could wipe everything away but it didn't work that way hey listen a lot of, a lot of times you get away from God it takes some time to get back to where you need to be you got to be persistent. You got to resolve in your heart. There was a return. And notice something else in verse 12. The details of revival is a refreshing. A refreshing of what? A refreshing of the goodness of God. Oh, look there in verse 12. He said, Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. You know why he gives something good? Because he can't help it. He's just a good giver. He's God. He gives us good gifts. He gives us great gifts. God can't give nothing bad in our life. Everything that He pours into mine in your life, everything that He allows to come mine in your way, whether it hurts us, whether it helps us at the moment, it's ultimately there for His glory and mine in your good. Notice we see a returning. We see a refreshing. And then another detail of revival is rejoicing. Again, notice what He said in verse number 6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? I wrote something down today. And this is my prayer for our church I met a Baptist back home and prayer for Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Florence, Kentucky. My prayer for you is this in this revival meeting. Woo, is that sin to be repented of. That spirits will be renewed and sight be restored. You see, when you get to looking down deep down inside and come clean and admit it, that you're not where you ought to be. That you hadn't been reading your Bible like you should have. That you hadn't been faithful to the things of God like you should be. That you hadn't been 
is dedicated in your walk with God. Oh, it's so easy. So easy to come in the house of God and put your best you have on and come in and look the part and act the part. But where the rubber meets the road is right out yonder in this world. Right around us. Did I tell you? Did I tell you, Miss Sidney? What we're willing to do without, we'll never have. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.